Sure, so. Do you recognize what this is? Judge, I can't see it. Right. Well, <laughs> you can't see this. It is a calendar. It's a book that's designed and has been around for generations of uh, an opportunity to put something on a calendar so that you know where you're supposed to be on any given day. So. I understand, Judge. I apologize. I, I put it on the wrong day. That's all right. We'll deal with it. So obviously you're not driving, correct? No, sir. I pulled over. Okay. <clears throat> then let's deal with uh, where we are on this uh, motion then, Mr. Vandervoort. You had, I think, a motion for a Rule 35 supplemental evaluation. Which I did. Uh, this matter, as the court knows, has been pending for some time. I, I just requested that we get a trial date, maybe out in out in time to work forward, maybe over into September, October, even. Uh, uh, if we want to accept one sooner, that's fine as well. And I just would judge, uh, of course, under uh, Ms. Henson being under a conservatorship, uh, I think it's imperative for everyone maybe to get an update as to her status, her mental health status, and. Uh, pursuant to the prior Rule 35 evaluation that was ordered, if that could be either supplemented or just, uh, or if a new one is required, uh, I think maybe we could initially get the, the records that are available and then kind of go from there. Maybe her her mental health providers could provide some information for us so the court will come from moving forward. That's our request. Ms. Roberts? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I spoke with uh my client yesterday and she has executed a release she's being seen on a regular basis through centerstone in hohenwald tennessee she has uh executed a release and i just make an, i need to make a formal request to get those records we would ask that those records as we have done in the past be held under seal and that they not be able to be disclosed um of course mr vandervoort can discuss the things in in those as it's pertinent to the issues in the divorce, but he will not. Our normal procedure is to mm -hmm. have them filed under seal, and counsel can review those records, but not make copies. And he's able to discuss with his client anything that might be significant for the case that are contained within the records, but the, uh, the client will not be allowed to view those records. Yes, Your Honor, and, and so <clears throat> we will get that, and then depending on what that is, also. Um, Previously, I had I had discussed with my client about her going on and filing for disability. She did take my advice and, and get that done, and she has a hearing on March 29th um, on, the, on that. I will tell you, I haven't been provided any documentation from her as to the application process, and I will get that um, and provide that through Mr. Odell about the disability and, and the status, but hopefully it will be um, something that I think we need to get a ruling on because, it, uh, it, again, it's going to affect the issue of insurability. Um, obviously, it's going to be our contention in this case um, that my client is disabled, that she is unable to, to maintain employment. As your Honor's aware of her past employment as a, as a uh, nurse practitioner in, in this area and serviced this area for a great number of years and treated many 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 of our children in this community uh, but she is not able to sustain that type at this point in time and i do not anticipate as an officer of the court that, that will ever be the situation um, and so the issue of, of permanent long-term alimony is going to be a factor but the health insurance provision is going to be the major issue it, it, it is incumbent that she maintain insurance um, so that she can she can continue to maintain treatment and to be medically compliant and can afford her medication um, and so if we get if this, she is approved for social security supplemental income through a disability she'd have access to medicare and medicaid right? yes your honor because it wouldn't be she, it would it wouldn't, wouldn't be the ssi portion it would be social security disability where she would have availability of the governmental insurance that would cover it and so then we would just need the cost of supplemental coverage um, but right now it's cost prohibitive you know she's still married um, she's on her husband's insurance uh, it's integral that she stays on that at this point in time um, and if she's denied on her disability, then again, you know, the cost of health insurance is going to be prohibitive. And then I anticipate 
my pleadings and asking this be maintained as a legal separation rather than a divorce so that we can maintain insurance on her. That's our critical critical point that we have that I have to deal with at this point in time. I think Mr. Odell is the conservator would agree that it would be cost prohibitive for us to, to even impossible for us to go out on the marketplace and to obtain coverage for Miss Miss Ray Henson um, for the psychiatric disorder that she suffers from. So whether or not we need to, once we get those records, uh, whether or not we need to have another Rule 35 or an update on on a on a evaluation, I think once we look at those records, uh, if Mr. Vandervoort wants to take a contrary position that she is able to work and maintain her own standard of living based on the fact that, of course, during the course of this marriage, it's uncontroverted. She she was the she made the most of the money when she was working as a nurse practitioner. She was the primary breadwinner. He worked, and they both had, they enjoyed a very significant income. But at this point in time, I think the the crux of it is if they're going to profess that she's able to go out and to obtain employment and maintain her own standard of living, that's where this Rule 35 is going to have to have to address. All right. Mr. Odell, I know you're uh, kind of out of pocket and probably not don't have your file with you, but do you have anything to add to what's been said? No, Your Honor, I concur with uh, what Ms. Roberts said. Um, I inquired about the disability and I, I think she actually she accurately described the situation with respect to the to the disability uh, claim. Well, let's talk first about going ahead and setting a final hearing date then. For the month of September, I, can, I have given the dates of uh, the 4th of September and the 5th of September. Um, I also gave the 23rd of September. These are all Dixon Chancery dates. <clears throat> Judge, I think the 23rd of September. Is that all day? It will be. I mean, I anticipate that it will be an all-day hearing, and so that was why, instead of doing it back to back on the fifth and the sixth, where we could have those other ones, that we would put it on the twenty-third. Well, what about the twenty-sixth? If you need an all-day hearing, twenty-six is acceptable to me. Twenty-six of September. Twenty-six of September. I can do, I can do September the twenty-sixth. That's the day that I had, but if, just, if this is going to be an all day, I don't want to take up the entire chance with it. So, Mr. Odell, do you have your calendar? Are you able to see if that's dates are available? I can. 26th of September is fine. Uh, we'll show the Dixon, uh, I'm sorry, that this will be in all day hearing on September the 26th. This is a hearing on the extension of a temporary restraining order that was issued ex parte. And, uh, Mr. Holly, I believe you were the moving party on the obtaining of that restraining order, so you wish to make an opening statement? I do, Judge. Is the rule requested? Judge, the rule is requested. Rule has been requested, so anyone who's going to be a witness in this case must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until you're called to testify. You are not to discuss the testimony of any other witness with anyone until such time as you have testified. Counsel are under a continuing duty to ensure that the rules comply with them. Yes, sir. Judge, this is a plaintiff to establish period. It's been going on for some time. I looked through the file last night since 2021. I think we need to get at the end of the day at least a, a date that maybe we can have a final hearing. The situation is I represent Brittany Tressler. Mr. Gervin has filed this action and requested um, that his parental rights be established, which they have been. The parties had a temporary hearing uh, back at that time when it originally was filed in front of Judge Lockard Mash. I was not a part of that with Ms. Trussell. She represented herself. I believe Ms. Hassel represented uh, Mr. Gervin at that time. And there's a temporary parenting plan in place that the parties have kind of been going by. We've had a few, a few issues here and there uh, and some motions have been filed and there's some uh, other temporary orders. One that's important in this case, which is in March of last year, was that uh, Mr. Gervin would not allow uh, Elena to be in the presence of his brother. There was some significant psychological issues with the brother and those types of things. And uh, that was pretty well done, I believe, by agreement in an order. I've showed that to his now uh, 
counsel. And that's part of what uh, the court will see in this in this hearing. This thing culminated in Ms. Tressler having some concerns about what was going on with the visitation on an afternoon. Uh, she was talking with her child and uh, called for a welfare check. Officer Moss, who has left the courtroom, will be testifying. We'll call him first. He works nights and he's with the city, so he needs to get out of here. He's going to testify that he went over there, that the brother was the only one over there, that he was supposed to be babysitting uh, Elena for, the, for quite a period of time. The house was a wreck. I've attached the photographs that the officers and he took uh, that, that were basically just of a apartment that wouldn't be fit for man or beast to live in to be to be polite about it um and you can hear from him about what he thought about the apartment when he was walking around and things of that nature the officer lastly that is going to be the next witness will testify that when he went to go serve the temporary restraining order on mr garvin that the um, apartment looked a little worse than what the photographs show to the court today and how they went about with um you know, getting the the summon signed, and uh, you know, when he left, basically he had to had to clean off his clean off his uniform, and he's going to testify to all of that. This is not a place that a child should be in, and I know he's got some pictures today that that will show that he's cleaned up a little bit. Our position is this has been a cyclical um, situation with Mr. Gervin throughout this entire time, and he's kind of at a low point now. This child needs some protection specifically, you know, for right now. So uh, when the court's ready and after the opening statements, I'll call Officer Moss. Judge, as you know, I, I don't have the benefit of being Mr. Gervin's lawyer throughout the pendency of this litigation. I'm here today just filling in for Mr. Barnhill, who's sick with the flu. Um, with that said, Your Honor, um, Mr. Hawley's right. The proof is going to show today that, that Mr. Gervin um, has some pictures for the court, the exact same pictures that were taken by the officer that, that entered his apartment that night that shows a completely different living situation. It shows a, a cleaned up environment, although not perfect, uh, substantially better than what the pictures allege. Judge, I would argue that the, the motion itself, coupled with the first exhibit, which is the report from the officer, it makes it sound as though Mr. Gervin is living in something I would describe as AE's newest episode of Hoarders. And, and it's really not that bad, Your Honor. Um, it's not great, it's not perfect, but I would argue that it, against Mr. Hawley's assertion that this is not a place fit for a child to be, um, Your Honor, I think the proof will show that. You know, I, I, they seem to, to think that maybe this is a continuing problem. Maybe there's evidence that it's been like this before. I don't know, like I said, I'm just here filling in today. Um, but without that showing, Judge, I, I don't think that continuing this restraining order based on these pictures that have now been kind of resolved uh, would be appropriate. Now, Mr. Hawley has argued that, that protection of the, this child is necessary, and I think this leads uh, to an important point, Judge. Uh, in the motion itself, Mr. Hawley has argued that this is the appropriate venue for this action, and Judge, I would disagree. Uh, they have essentially raised allegations of dependency and neglect. Now, they haven't called them DNA allegations, but they've essentially alleged that the condition that the child was in was in such state of, of squalor uh, that it poses a, a substantial risk of safety to the child. Judge, that, that is straight up an, an allegation of dependency and neglect, um, and I believe that action should have been filed in the juvenile court, which has exclusive and original jurisdiction for DNA matters. Uh, Judge, I... If the court's not inclined to transfer the action or find that the venue's not appropriate and we continue with this hearing, um, I, I would argue that the allegations made are, are now moot based on the conditions of the apartment. Um, I think the, the motion itself was twofold, if I remember correctly. Um, temporary restraining order based on two things, uh, a lack of employment bad living conditions, the proof is going to show today that none of those exist. Those have now been corrected. I would ask that your honor set aside the, the restraining order and allow the parties to continue down the path of, of setting this thing for a final year. Let me first address the issue of, of your 
argument that the uh, allegations sound in dependency and neglect, and therefore your argument that this should properly have been brought in juvenile court. Once they, this court has concurrent jurisdiction over matters of paternity actions that are filed, they can file it in juvenile court or they can file it here. Mr. Gervin availed himself of this court's jurisdiction by filing the, uh, actually, yes, he filed the petition to establish paternity. So he brought the matter in before the court instead of going into juvenile court. Secondly, once the matter is before the court, <clears throat> this court has the jurisdiction over the best interest of the minor child. Uh, if there, if I, every time that there's something that could rise to the level of a dependency and neglect petition uh, in juvenile court that's raised in a divorce court, uh, custody case, or anything else, which happens routinely, if I then have to transfer it to juvenile court, our whole system will become unworkable. Therefore, this court finds that we have jurisdiction over the matter uh, before us and that the best interest of the minor child, which is the preeminent consideration of this court in any custody case, will allow the court to consider the evidence even if it rises to the level of what could have been brought in juvenile court as a dependency and neglect. For that reason, um, any, any oral motion that I would consider to have been made to transfer this to juvenile court is respectfully denied. We'll proceed with the hearing on the temporary restraining order. Mr. Holly, you may call your first witness. Joe Moss, Your Honor. And how long have you been with the uh, city of Dixon now? I can't remember. A little over a year and a half now. Okay. And how long have you been in law enforcement totally? Uh, to include corrections time, a little over uh, <clears throat> four, five, six years. Six yeah. and a half years, I'm sorry. All right. And especially during your last year and a half with the city of Dixon, have you had an opportunity to uh, go on calls such as this one where you go out to people's houses and try to resolve situations that are domestic in nature? On a daily basis, sir. Okay. And would you say you've had a lot of experience in those types of calls at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. On January the 27th of, um, and you put in here 2023 in your report, that should be 2024, correct? Yes, sir. I apologize. I that was a typo. I'll fix that. Okay. On January 27th of this year, 2024, did you have an opportunity to go to the home of uh, Mr. Robert Allen Gervin? Yes, sir. And it says here in your report that was around 1,850 hours. What what time was would that be? That'd be around 6:50. Okay. And uh, right. that was yes, it. sir. And whereabouts in the city of Dixon is that? Uh, apartment complex down off of Beasley Drive and right. Cowan. And uh, Officer Moss, I'm going to give you the floor at this point. Can you describe to the court, you know, from basically start to finish, uh, when you got there, what, what happened? Who did you see? Who did you talk to? And uh, what condition did you find his apartment? I would need to see my report to reference his exact name, but we uh, got to the apartment. Um, the uncle was there watching the kids, and the, per uh, dispatch, they had a... Uh, order saying that he wasn't supposed to have any contact with the kids and from what he told me the uh, father left the kid or the child i should say with the uncle due to wanting to go out and make money so if i and i can give you the report out of counsel i will do that if you need it but it was john garvin was that the name of the uncle yes sir okay and um at the time that that you got there and you're talking about having to go make money. What what was the purpose of him having to make money on that day? He said he wanted to go, or uh, the father wanted to go out, do DoorDash delivery so he could get the uh, daughter some spaghetti. Okay. Um, was there references that he didn't have money for food at that time? Yes. Tell the court then, continue on. What condition did you find the apartment when you were talking to Mr. John Gervin at that time? Okay, so when we walked in, uh, Mr. Gervin had the stove on because he said his hands were cold and he was trying to heat up the uh, apartment to warm up and also use the stove to light his cigarettes. It was probably one of the most disgusting apartments I have been into in my law enforcement career. There was trash piled up probably about close to approximately four and a half, five feet high in the closet. There was the stove had trash all over it and dirt all over the stove, which I did include in my pictures. And also it could be, if you uh, need to see body cam, body cam would show just how disgusting it was. There were bugs coming out of coffee mugs. I'm sorry, bugs coming out of coffee mugs? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a uh, thing of uh, 
ice cream on the counter that was half or that was melted and just sitting on the counter. The uh, daughter's room was trashed. There was trash all over the apartment. And uh, yeah, it was definitely unfit for having a child in that apartment based on what the conditions were. And I did make a DCS referral based on uh, my observations. Okay. Have you heard back from the DCS referral? Have they contacted you in any manner? No. Okay. I want to show you some photographs. Ask you if you recognize those photographs as the pictures you took uh, on that day. Yes, I do. Can you pick a couple of those out and describe those for the core as to what what you saw and why you took a photograph of, of these types of scenes in the apartment? Well, I wanted to document just what we saw. So on this first one, you can see the stove. And also, there wasn't a single clean uh, dish anywhere in that apartment. They opened cabinets up and there weren't anything clean. It was so you can see on the stove is dirty pot pans. You could, the photo is lousy, uh, or lousy print, but all the markings on there was just dirt all over that stove. So this one, that was the, uh, just showing all the dirty dishes. Trash piled sky high in the apartment. Sorry, trash piled sky high. And we talked to Mr. Gervin about it and I told him, why don't you clean this place up? And he said, well, it's due to a snowstorm, but that's A, a week prior, and B, there's a dumpster right there in the apartment complex that can just take trash right down to. How far away was the dumpster from the apartment, would you say? It'd be walking distance. I couldn't give an exact distance how far it is from it, but easy to walk to. Okay. All right, go ahead. So more trash showing uh, on the counters. So this one just showed a limited amount of food that was in the cabinet and how there was a thing of cereal and that was it in the cabinet. So it was very limited on food. And the daughter had told me that she had a pizza and a Dr. Pepper and that was all she had. I'm sorry, I objected to hearsay. May I respond? Yes. A judge, I would, I would first off say this is an 80325 exception to statements, you know, especially if this officer who's uh, uh, set forth the foundation of his ability to recognize these types of things. Um, as a uh, statement made in a complaint to establish period as a chancery court proceeding about abuse and neglect, uh, you know, of a minor child in this situation. Overruled. <clears throat> you can go ahead. Go ahead and finish with your explanation. Yes, sir. So when we asked her what she had to eat that day, she said some old pizza and she had a Dr. Pepper and that was all she had to drink. They didn't have any bottled water or, and apparently she doesn't get water from the sink. So that was all she had that day was a Holly, one I, Dr. Pepper. Excuse me, officer. Uh, are these the same photographs he's referencing that are in the color of photographs that you had attached to your motion? They should be judged. When yes, I sir. got these from the city of Dixon, uh, they sent the color ones over it. I didn't get any other color ones. So I've got the black and white ones. Reference, you want to utilize those? I noticed his are black and white. It may be helpful. Yes, sir. I was planning on moving those into the evidence uh, instead of these that he's got in his hands. Show put. those officer to uh, opposing counsel before we go any further. Thank you, Your Honor. I just think it black and white is a little bit harder to see the details. So go ahead. Yes, sir. So on this one now, if you can see on the color photo, you can see clearly how much dirt there was on that stove and how it appears it wasn't cleaned in a long period of time. In this one, you can see that container of ice cream that I mentioned that was melted ice cream just sitting on the counter. And this was that trash pile that I was discussing and how high the trash was piled up in the cabinet. Another one showing trash on the counter. Again, they were saying they didn't have money for food, but you can see the empty beer containers and cigarettes on the counter that where if that money was spent on food for a child versus on alcohol. Yes, sir. This one picture shows the trash on the counter and then the very little food that was in that cabinet and not nothing fit for a child to consume for a day. This was her bedroom showing just the amount of trash on the floor in the bedroom and I had to step around everything to be able to even get in that room. You couldn't see the floor due to the amount of trash. 
further trash on the floor in her room. And this one, I want to show the garbage bag just sitting there in the bedroom versus being taken out to a dumpster and more trash on the floor. You said that was in the bedroom? Yes. Oh. Again, a little bit more detail of how much trash was in that bedroom. So this one show more empty cigarette containers and some like of that on the uh, just by the TV versus in a trash bag or and with cigarettes they're e they're easy uh, for her to have been able to get to and if she'd grab one of those it'd be very unhealthy for a child for around all that cigarette smoke. Bedroom, uh, the adult bedroom in the apartment showing how much trash was on the floor in his bedroom and also slightly cleaner than the child's bedroom where he lived versus mm -hmm. where his child lives, which I found that that wasn't too uh, conducive to a child. And this one, just showing all the cigarette butts and everything else out on the uh, balcony of the apartment. Does that look like a planter, like for a plant? Is that how you found that? Yes. And is that, would you say that's nearly full of just cigarette butts? Yes. And then empty, uh, containers of uh, soda and other trash all piled around it. Okay. Judge, I would introduce that as collective one to the board. Collective one. All right, Officer Moss. So um, did, did Robert Allen Garvin eventually show up at the apartment? Yes, sir. And your discussions with Mr. Garvin, where where did he tell you that actually he had been? Well, what was his his reasoning as why he wasn't there? He said he was out door dashing because he didn't have a job, so he was trying to get money for his daughter, or to buy spaghetti for his daughter because he said she wanted spaghetti for dinner. Okay. Um, was there anything else that was said between you and Mr. Robert Allen Garving that was concerning at all? Well, he told me how he has uh, has had brain cancer and was a veteran. So I tried to give him some uh, pointers on where he could go to, including the uh, VA helpline to be able to get help. I also tried to tell him that he needed to clean his apartment up for her and then take pictures. So that way he could show the court that it was cleaned up, which I don't know if he's done or not. I have, I'm not privy to that, but so I tried to give him some pointers on what he needs to do to clean up his act. Okay. And when you were out there, what, what other officers were there with you? Sergeant Rapogel and also uh, Patrolman uh, Lefevre. Okay. And is there any question at all that, you know, when you showed up that that was John Gervin that was watching the lineup? Not at all. We got his ID. Okay. So at the end of the day here, Officer Moss, um, how did you leave the situation with Elena apparently there at the apartment? Did she get to stay there? Did you make her go somewhere else? No. Nope. What did y'all do? Based on the safety for Elena, we called her mom. Her mom uh, responded to the apartment and uh, we uh, brought her out to her mom. And she was crying as we brought her out because she clearly loves her dad, but it just, we couldn't leave a child in those conditions. Very well. All right, that's all I had, Judge. You back to the gym. Yes, mom, Judge. And you've been with the Dixon Police Department for a year and a half? Approximately. What was the reason for uh, going over to Mr. Gervin's apartment that night? We were dispatched because uh, Lena's mother uh, called saying that Mr. Gervin's uncle, who uh, she said had a no contact order with uh, her child was watching her child due to text messages she received and she wanted to check on the status of her child. So it was a welfare check on the child? Yes. At what point um, in your interaction uh, on this night, I'm sorry, did you say it was January 24th or 27th? 27th. Friday, January 27th? Uh, I'd have to look on the calendar, but I'm pretty sure that'd be a Friday, yes. Um, at what point when you showed up to Mr. Gervin's apartment, 
uh, were your concerns about the welfare of the child? The minute we walked in. Well, hold on a second. Were they alleviated on the, the report from the mom? Based on what the mom said, we responded, but we always keep an open mind because we get calls all the time. So we have to go in and investigate for ourselves. So when I got there, the second we uh, saw the inside of that apartment, we had major concerns for the welfare of the child. Regardless of any of the uh, court orders on who can watch a child or not, it was just based on the, con the conditions of the apartment were brought up our primary concerns. What all did you search when you got in the house? I didn't search anything in the house. We uh, asked him if we can uh, see if there was food because all the trash on the floor, all the garbage around the apartment that was in plain view from the second we walked in. And we asked him to open the cabinet to show us if there was food or not. So he opened the cabinet and he also opened the fridge and there was none. Minus those few items I took a picture of. So you searched the cabinets in the fridge and in general, just the, the apartment itself as a whole. I didn't search it. We just walked around the apartment, just seeing what the conditions were. Well, you, it wasn't you asked to open the cabinets, right? So you could look inside. Yes. And he complied. Because again, we were trying to check on the welfare of the child. Would you call that a, a search by consent? Yes. Yes. Because we asked him if we could see, and he said yes. And I, I noticed there wasn't a picture of the contents of the fridge. What was in the fridge? A beer. Okay. Um, there was no food in there for a child, so I didn't even bother taking pictures of the inside. At any point in, during your interaction with, with Mr. John Gervin or Mr. Robert Gervin, um, did you come to find out when the beer had been purchased? No, we didn't. Okay. So is it possible that uh, the beer that you found on the counter that you testified to under direct, I think you said something about maybe their money should have been spent on food, not beer. Um, you don't know when that was purchased, do you? No, I don't, but he said he had, he was thirsty that morning. So he pulled a beer out to have a drink. And was that Robert that said that? Uh, John, John's the, uh, Brother, your client's Robert, right? Yes. Okay, then it'd be John. But regardless, if you're struggling with money, there are things that you can look at that are priorities over alcohol and cigarettes. Well, now who's struggling with money, Robert or John? Both of them. Okay. Who's spending money on beer and cigarettes? I don't know which one. At what point in the interaction did you give Mr. Robert Gervin tips on how to, I think as you put it, clean up his act? When we started talking to him and he got to the apartment. Okay. Is this before or after the child left with the mom? Before and after. I'd like to show you some pictures, officer, if I may. Uh, and your honor, I'm happy to show these to opposing counsel. I showed them to him in discussions right. early before we started the hearing. <clears throat> Officer Mills, I'm just going to hand you my iPad. All right, that's a black and white of the stove. Is this the picture uh, you took that you testified to earlier? Uh, is that the one from my report? Can you tell me? It, it looks similar, but I'm uh, not 100% positive if you took that out of my report or not. Okay. So as it's just a picture on your iPad. I, it says filed February. Yes, then. So this is the picture that we're Judge, I would object as far as the stamp of anything and him trying to authenticate it. Obviously, Officer Moss didn't make that stamp, so he has no way to testify. Officer either. can't authenticate the photographs. He can testify as to what they reflect. Obviously, they, the photographs will speak for themselves, but as far as the officer, he didn't take the photographs, if I understand correctly, so therefore he can only observe what's shown in the photograph and cannot so, authenticate I'm not trying to and judge this this I would also have an objection as to the relevance here I, officer Moss 
was there on that date. He took photographs on that date. Now, I understand these are photographs where uh, Mr. Gervin's attempted to clean up the apartment somewhat, but he has no knowledge of any of this. And it would be up to Mr. Gervin really to authenticate every one of these photographs. And I don't think it would be relevant for Mr. Moss to go through all of these to explain photographs of what Mr. Gervin has done after the fact. He has no knowledge of it. The council has opened the door to this issue by testifying not only to the, the pictures on direct examination, but this officer specifically gave my client instruction to clean the apartment. I'm just trying to show him the result of that so I can have some follow up questions. On it. But at the same time, we don't know when these photographs were taken at this point. We have absolutely no idea who took them, when they were taken. I, you know, Officer Moss can't testify to any of that as to whether it was subsequent or prior to his photographs. I think we're losing sight of the fact that Officer Moss is not the one who's going to be making the decision in this case. And therefore, it's not relevant, no offense intended, whether he thinks that the uh, apartment has been cleaned up appropriately or not. That falls to me to have that decision. So I'm going to sustain the objection because I don't think it's relevant to have him go through your photographs and say, oh, you know, I think he's done a good job. He's testified what the conditions were. He's testified the advice he gave. The question of whether or not your client has followed the advice or not is a question that I have to determine, not this officer. Yes, Judge. So we'll, we'll just ask it this way. Officer, the advice you gave Mr. Gervin to clean the apartment, I suppose it's hypothetical. Each and every picture that you have in front of you, each and every picture that you took that shows the condition of the apartment as it existed that day you were there. Let's assume for purposes of this hypothetical, none of the trash is on the counters. There's still trash all over the floors though. Let me finish. There's no trash on the counters. There's no trash on the floor. There's no piles, sky high as you call it, of cardboard trash in low entry way or closet or whatever that was. No trash on the floors. No trash on the stove. The stove has been cleaned of all the burnt food and the good that you testified to earlier. Had the apartment looked that way as I've just described it in a hypothetical to you, would you have been concerned? Yeah, Judge, I renewed my same objection, and it goes to the heart of what the court just said. It's not up to the officer here to give his opinion as to the condition of the house and what that would what that would relieve of his suggestion of what he suggested. This is uh, something for Mr. Gervin and, and his lawyer to take up at that time. I don't think it's relevant anything that uh, Officer Moss would say at this point, and it's based on speculation. Judge, it's a hypothetical. I'm having a hard time understanding why it's not relevant. If he's testified that the condition of the apartment when he got there so caused so much concern that he had to initiate a DCM. But what you're asking the officer to say is, is that with the conditions that were there, he found it to be unacceptable. If those conditions were not there, would he have found it acceptable? That's Which exactly is, what I'm asking. You know, that's a simple yes or no question. Was that true? If those, if all of those bad conditions weren't there, would you have had any issue with the apartment? With the apartment itself? No. Okay. Thank you, officer. Mr. Holly asked you on direct examination, who were the officers that arrived on the scene with you that night? Um, I heard you say patrol officer Lef Lefevre. Yes, sir. And then you said sergeant, and I didn't catch your last name. Rapolgo. Can you spell that? Maybe? Your Honor, would, can I pull my phone out and pull up the spelling? You may. Please accord. It's in the report that's attached to the motion that I think everybody has as well. It's, I'm just a filler. I don't have the actual file with me. It's R E P R O G A L. First name Sierra. Pro R E P R O G A L. R E P R O G A L. Thank you, officer. <coughs> you testified earlier that you have um, body cams at, at Dixon Police Department. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's right. right here on my vest. Um, have you reviewed any of that body cam footage in preparation of your testimony today? No, sir. Do you know if your body cam was operational that night? Yes, sir. All of them were. Um, has that footage been preserved to the best of your knowledge? Every single body cam uh, video we have gets uploaded onto the system and stays on it. How long were you at Mr. Gervin's apartment in total from the time you arrived? I think you said roughly about 650 to the time you left. I would have to see the CAD report to see what dispatch said, what time was that we cleared the call, so I don't know. 
Can you give me an approximation as to what time the mother showed up to get the child? Again, I'd have to see dispatch CAD report to where it was documented, so no, I can't. How, how was the child reacting when she learned she was coming back with mom? She cried. Did she say anything? I don't remember. Do you recall how long mom was present on scene? Long enough for us to check her ID and make <laughs> sure that she was who she was. Talk to her, give her advice because she asked me some questions and we uh, answered them and then she took the child home. Judge, that's all I have for this witness. Shall I redirect? Um, the court's inclined. May I look at the uh, police report that was filed with the motion? I, I'm going to work on I know opposing counsel referenced that. I'm going to ask him to maybe authenticate what, what he's got there and enter that into evidence. Mr. Moss, I'm going to hand you a document and ask you if you recognize that document as your report. Yes, sir. And this is a report that you entered into the city of Dixon based on your communications with the Gervin at their apartment on that January 27th, 2024 day, correct? Yes, sir. And the only issue with the report, uh, you can look through it, but we've already established it should be 2024 and that would be a change, but is there anything else that uh, you would recant or add to in your report? No, sir. I would move that in as uh, exhibit number two, Judge. No objection being made. Typically, police reports are hearsay and they're not admissible, but with the consent of both parties, will allow it to be introduced. That's all I have. <clears throat> Can you recross? Thank you, sir. You may step down. We're releasing you from your subpoena so you can go get some sleep before your yes, work tonight. Mr. Holly, you may call your next witness. Judge, before we get there, my client needs to use the restroom. Can he take a brief recess? Do that? He needs to go to the restroom? Yes, Judge. All right, well, we'll take a mid morning recess. Uh, Take a recess for 15 minutes. I have uh, Chris Lashley with the police uh, sheriff's department. <laughs> I'm sorry, Judge. Yes, sir. He'll be the next uh, witness we'll call. Mr. Holly, you may call your next witness. Call Officer Charles Lashley. Sorry, Chris Lashley. Officer Lashley, can you hear me? Deputy Lashley, can you hear me? Earth to Lashley, can you hear me? Well, this should be good. He's going to start driving. So. <laughs> Deputy Lashley, Lashley, can you hear me? Isn't he just up the hill? That looks like the sheriff's department, yes, sir. Can you communicate with him? Say something. Anything. Can't hear you. Ask him if he can just come down here since he's just up there. If, if he's at the sheriff's department, he can be here in a couple of minutes. That looks like what he's doing. He buckled up. Do you want me to go ahead and call Mr. Tressler? We can move on. And then it looks like maybe headed this way. You can do that. Mr. Tressler, come on off. We're good story. And the father is Robert Allen Gardner, correct? Yes. And you guys are in the middle of uh, an establishment of paternity action here in this court, correct? Correct. <clears throat> now, um, you, you know why you're here today, correct? Yes, sir. Can you explain to the court? Uh, what made you get concerned that on January 27th of 2024, what made you get concerned enough to uh, uh, make, make the phone calls that you did? Yes. So um, Elena was at her father's for the weekend for his visitation, Tom. Um, she has her own little cell phone. It does not have cell service, but it has Wi-Fi capability. Um, along with this phone, it has an app on it um, called Facebook Messenger Kids. Um, I control everything on who she can talk to, who she cannot talk to, things like that. And she has access to be able to communicate with her father. Um, all messages, anything like that through her phone will notify my cell phone and come through my cell phone as well. Um, I was currently at dinner and a message came across that was a little concerning um, between Elena and her father stating that he, I guess Elena had FaceTimed him. I'm not sure what was in that conversation in the FaceTime, but the text message that came across was stating, he will have to wait until I'm done dashing, which kind of concerned me. So I FaceTimed my daughter just to try to see how her night was going. 
Um, and that is when I was made aware of the fact that she was in the apartment without her father and she was um, in the custody of her uncle who she is not to be around. Okay. And did you telephone uh, the authorities? Yes, sir, I did. And you asked for a welfare check, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so at the end of the afternoon there, did you get a call from them to go get Elena? Yes, sir. And when you arrived at uh, Mr. Robert Gervin's apartment, uh, what what did you observe? What did you do first when you got there? To um, start to finish, what happened? When um, me and my boyfriend arrived at the apartment, we went up the stairs. We knocked on the door. Um, we walked through the door. Immediately when we walked through the door, Officer Moss met us and was like, I will speak to you all outside. We were ushered back outside into the breezeway. Um, from then, Officer Moss, you know, communicated with us, took my ID, talked to us about the state of the apartment and his concerns. Judge, I'm going to object to hearsay. Again, the 80325 type exception, and well, he's already testified to about what he did. <clears throat> At this point, I'm not, I'm not going to overrule the objection. I'm admitting it not to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but rather to show what steps she had taken that evening. And it'll be limited for that purpose. Um, we were speaking with um, Officer Moss. Um, he was explaining to us to the concern that he had of the state of the apartment um, and that he believed that it would be best that we take Elena home with us that night. Okay. And in fact, is that what you did? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and since then, and sitting in here today, you've had an opportunity to see the photographs of Mr. Robert Gervin's apartment, correct? Correct. And a little history here with Mr. Robert Gervin. Obviously, you've had a child together. Mm -hmm. Have you lived with him at some point? We have, yes. And for what length of time? <sighs> Probably about a year um, fully living together. Okay. Do you, uh, or how do you find, uh, you know, the apartment, the photographs that you saw, and the, and the testimony you've heard today in relation to, uh, you know, what it was when you lived with him? Judge, I'm going to object to relevance. I'm not sure what this has to do with the restraining order. It goes to show, and it goes, and I can call her back, I guess it's a rebuttal, but you know, he's already attempted to show some photographs of we're all better now with the house and the cleanliness of it. And I'm offering this uh, to show that, you know, this is kind of a pattern with Mr. Garvin. And she definitely has the ability to testify to that having lived with it. Well, at this point, we haven't seen those photographs because you objected to them. So I'll have to sustain his objection. It's not relevant at this point. It becomes relevant if and when those other those photographs are introduced and that the, Mr. Garvin were to testify as to changes he's made in the conditions. So. Has okay. They just has uh, has Elena expressed to you things again regarding neglect of her over at the apartment that caused you concern? I wouldn't necessarily say neglect. There has been occasions that she has came home, um, you know, and just in talking with my daughter, um, you know, her hair may be tangly, and I'll ask, "Well, did you brush your hair while you were with your daddy?" Um, and there was times that, "Well, I don't have a hairbrush at daddy's," or you know her breath might be kind of stinky and so i'm like what well, did you brush your teeth at your daddy's um and her response would be well judge, i don't I'm, have a toothbrush judge i'm gonna object to hearsay i don't think this witness can testify as to the statements made by the child I think this is not rising to the level of abuse so i sustain the objection so let's talk about john garvin and you're made aware that john garvin was left alone with elena that day yes sir so from your, again, living with Robert Gervin and understanding his brother and the things that Robert Gervin has told you about his brother, why is it concerning to you that that Elena was at that point around John Gervin? Um, being in a relationship with Robert in the past, um, there was always concern with the brother um, being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia um, and having some mental problems. Um, even back when we were a couple that was always, you know, in question, um, and it judge, was brought into question another, again. <clears throat> judge, I'm going to object. Um, my objection on this is is going to be twofold. Uh, I'm not really sure um, why any of this testimony about the uncle is relevant. It's my understanding that today's hearing is solely on the restraining order, not about uh, the reasons behind why there's a no contact and why contact with the child is concerning. I I, I get that that's a fine line, but I, I don't think that that's relevant for purposes of today's prelim. Well, part of the reason the restraining order was issued was because there was an allegation. There's a court order that was entered in this case, and I realize you're filling in, but the order was entered on March the 2nd, I'm sorry, March 16th from a March 2nd hearing. A specific provision of that order is, <clears throat> it is further ordered to judge and decree that the minor child shall have absolutely no contact with John Gervin, the brother of the father. That was signed off on by J. Reese Holly and B. Davis Barnhill. And that was signed by this court, by me. 
there was a motion to remove the no contact order, and <clears throat> that has never been heard. Um, and, and then there was a motion for contempt and for sanctions filed by Mr. Holly for non payment of child support, apparently. In any event, the motion for an emergency restraining order in this case cites specifically um, the violation of the order by the child being left alone in, in the uh, custody of John Gervin. It's in paragraph four of the motion for emergency and emergency temporary restraining order. Paragraph four says on the 16th day of March 2023, the court entered an agreed order wherein the minor child is to have absolutely no contact with John Gervin's paternal uncle. And then it goes on to cite the fact that the child was found to be in the possession of the paternal uncle with whom she is to have no contact. So it was very much a part of this proceeding, and therefore I overrule any objection. Judge, may I be heard briefly on that issue? Pardon? May I be heard briefly Pardon? on that issue? Well, I understand that part of the basis for the temporary restraining order was the fact that the child was found with the uncle. That's fine, but we're getting into testimony here about the uncle's mental condition, his diagnoses, and what he's being medicated for. I don't think that testimony specifically is relevant for this TRO hearing. I think that testimony is relevant for the contempt issue that I think Mr. Barnhill and Mr. Hawley have set at the end of this month. That's the basis of the objection I have. Well, I'm overruling the objection nonetheless because it does lay a foundation for showing why it is important in this witness's <clears throat> mind that the court order be complied with. And that is the reason for, as I've stated, that was part of the basis for the court issuing the ex parte restraining order. And therefore, I will <clears throat> overrule your objection, allow it. But I think she's established why she had concerns. So I think we can move on. So, uh, and just to reiterate a little bit, that March 16, 2023 order, uh, you're aware that was an agreed order between you and Mr. Robert Garvin, correct? Correct. So, as far as concerns around Elena with uh, Mr. John Garvin, what has Robert Garvin told you specifically as to the reasons why, you know, Elena should not be around John Garvin? Um, Robert has told me different times that, you know, there is concerns with his brother, his brother's temper, um, whether his brother, you know, is stably taking his medications and things like that. Um, you know, I've been told by Robert before that, you know, he can't take care of himself. The brother cannot. Um, and that, you know, it's hard to be able, you know, it, it's somehow fallen on him to not only take care of his daughter, but to, I guess, have to take care of his brother as well. Okay. And what, again, um, don't strike that. So was it concerning to you that, that Elena was around John Gervin at that point? Yes. When you saw the photographs that Officer Moss took and that we put into evidence, what concerns you about the photographs of Elena's room? Not just the trash that was around, um, but it, it brought, up, brought up questions on how long has his brother actually still been around my daughter that I was not brought aware of. There was men's clothing strewn all over, um, you know, the, the floor, you know, the bed was not made. Um, and it appears to look like a bunk bed, but only one bed is made. Um, I can't, you know, speak on what his rules are for our daughter when she is in his care, but with, you know, at my house, she knows if she is not laying in her bed, her bed is to be made. Um, that's how I know the room is clean and, you know, she has done the chores that she has asked to do. You're concerned, you know, you heard the testimony about uh, today from Officer Moss that apparently, you know, John Gervin was drinking a beer in the morning time. Mm -hmm. Based on his, and as you know, and before we testified to his mental condition, does that concern you that he's ingesting alcohol along with the lineup? That early in the morning, yes. And uh, you've contacted me, and we have filed this uh, uh, emergency temporary restraining order, correct? Yes. What are you asking the court to do today as far as the, the contact between Robert Gervin and Elena? At the moment, I would like to keep it as it is. Um, he is more than welcome to contact me or his daughter and see her at any time. If we do not have anything going on as far as a sporting event or things like that, he's more than welcome to come to her sporting events. He's more than welcome to contact me or his daughter and ask us to meet up for, you know, a hangout at the park or at Burger King or, you know, anywhere. But I feel like for the time being, it should be put in place that there, you know, is visual proof that the brother is not around um, and visible proof that, you know, the apartment is completely cleaned up, you know, in a better state for her to be able to stay with him. 
Ed, you uh, you talk about sporting events. Elena does track, correct? I do track and field. Um, she is basically the team's mascot. <laughs> so, at times, has he picked her up from school there when when you're with Elena and things of that nature? Yes, he is. He has came to Creekwood and picked her up from Creekwood while I'm holding practice. How would you? Or, or dropped her off as well. As far as. Um, Oh, and uh, are you, were you ever made aware that DCS has contacted anybody in this case? You heard Officer Moss make a referral. Officer Moss stated that he was going to put uh, put in the referral, but I have not been contacted by anyone from DCS letting stating that it has gone anywhere. Have you been made aware as a parent that Elena's been contacted at all? No. Did they meet with her at school? She informed me th um, the next morning after the fact when we were walking to our classrooms because I work in her school. Um, we were walking through the office and she proceeded to tell me that she had been called to the office the day before to and was spoken to by a lady. Uh, and as far as the court, you know, it's up to the court what to do in this situation, but as far as having some sort of cooperation that the apartment stays clean, what are you suggesting happened in that regard? Whether it be, um, whether it be me going to the apartment and physically knocking on the door and being able to step in and you know i don't want to look through you know his personal belongings or anything like that i you know that's not my concern but being able to walk inside the apartment if i can see that it is physically clean then i would be okay you you heard officer moss testify that apparently there was only an old piece of pizza and dr pepper that she had to work on all day does that cause you concern it does um it does um i know when she's home with me i mean she she could easily eat me out of house and home you know she's constantly coming and asking for you know mom can i have a snack or mom can i get a drink or mom will you make me this um i'm pretty sure the child would live on macaroni and cheese if i allowed her to uh, <laughs> so what, what would you say her hunger level is when she returns from robert garvin's home um she Typically, as soon as we walk in, she'll ask if she can go to the pantry and get a snack. Um, that doesn't raise much concern. She is a growing eight-year-old who, like I said, would eat all day long if I allowed her to. Um, so that doesn't, you know, at the time it didn't concern me when she would come home and be like, Mom, can I have a snack? Um, but after hearing um, Officer Moss and seeing pictures, it, you know, kind of threw up some questions on how much did she actually eat while she was with her father. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Let me cross-examine. Mr. Ressler, let me ask, you testified on direct just now with your lawyer um, about living arrangements with Mr. Gerdman. How long ago did y'all live together? That was back in 2020. How long was it for? A year. We were in that place for a year. What sort of, um, what was Mr. Gerdman's appointment like during that one year? I'm sorry. What was Mr. Gervin's employment like during that year you were living together? Um, he worked for a company where he was gone for a few weeks and then he would be home for a week. You say he'd be gone for a few weeks. Where typically would he go? Wherever his work was at that point. Like out of state? Yes. Okay. So during the year that you lived together, he was gone more often than he was there. Is that right? Correct. So if he's gone more often than he's there when you live together, if you have complaints about the house being messy, um, really wouldn't be entirely his fault, would it? Well, I don't live with him now, so. I'm, I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about during the year period that you guys lived together. Okay, well, the year period that we lived together, the house was never in a state like his apartment is. Okay. I, you didn't testify on direct exam with your with a lawyer that he had a history of being messy? He, I mean, yes, there is a history, you know, but. He would never help me clean without being asked. What, what would you describe as his messy? Things left out, containers left out, cans left out, clothes not put in laundry hampers. Let me ask you, you testified that you wanted visual proof that the house is clean and that you wanted visual proof that the brother's not there. Um, what sort of visual proof do you need that, that I guess John, I think is his name, that John's not there. Well, I would just need to know that, you know, he's 
especially if she's, you know, if he's not going to be in the apartment, then he, I would need to know that my daughter is not left with the brother. In our previous order that we are working on now, I clearly, and that we are trying to come in agreement with, I clearly have tried to reason with Mr. Garvin in allowing Elena to be around his brother, but I don't agree with my daughter being around him unsupervised, given his history. When you say him, you're talking about the brother. Yes. So you're not entirely opposed to the minor child being around the uncle? No, sir. Okay. I, it just does not need to be unsupervised, ever. Give me one second, Judge. I think you testified, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you testified earlier that some of the concern you had um, was that with specifically with your daughter's room, there were clothes on the floor and beds weren't made. Was that right? Correct. Isn't that normal for an eight-year-old child, though, to not want to make a bed, not want to do their chores and pick up their clothes? Isn't that kind of normal? Yes, yes. I, there is times that I have to stay on her, even at my house, um, that she needs to clean her room. <laughs> but I can tell her, you know, Elena, like, you need to go clean your room or X, Y, and Z is going to happen, whether I'm taking away phone privilege or I'm not allowing her, you know, to talk, you know, go to a friend's house or anything. Like, she knows that it is expected of her at my house that her room is to be cleaned. Um, and she is very good at, you know, if I notice that her room is clean and I say, Elena, you need to go clean your room, she will go clean her room. But every morning before we go to school, she makes her bed. Judge, I think that that's all I've got, Ms. Dressler. <clears throat> So, as far as her room goes, do you think it's Elena's responsibility to clean up men's clothes that are in there? No, sir, I do not. To clean up trash bags, beer cans, all that that's around? No, sir, I do not. Do you have to clean up trash bags and beer cans and men's clothes at your house? No, sir. You can certainly, you know, again, as far as John Bergen goes, apparently he's drinking beer early in the morning and they're all trying to raise money for dinner. Yes. Nothing further. You've seen the pictures that were demonstrated at court, I think, is that correct? Yes, sir. And I don't know if you can see them when I put them up there, but this is a photograph that was made in an exhibit that shows a shelf where food would normally be. Do you see any kind of food in that photograph? It looks like a hot chocolate box and maybe a box of cereal. Okay. And then you've seen what was on the, for example, what was on the shelf or on the countertops, which is a apparently empty pasta, pasta pastaroni, some empty cans of corn, a melted thing of, of uh, ice cream. Yes, sir. And there was another picture, I think, of this. But that is that what you're talking about, your concerns regarding the food that's in the house and what Officer Moss testified about? Yes. Then Mr. Holly asked you questions about the condition of the room and whether, and I think you were asking cross-examination. But are those pictures of clothing that belong to your daughter? No, no, sir. Is that a picture of any clothing that you see of your daughter's in that picture? No, sir. Same picture from a different angle. Any pictures that you see of clothing of your daughter? No, sir. Well, whose clothing does that appear to be? Men's clothing, whether they be her father's or the uncle's. I'm Anything not sure. In this photograph, do you see any of an eight-year-old child's daughter's clothing in any of those pictures? No, sir. But you understand, is that the, the bedroom where your daughter was staying at her dad's? Uh, yes, sir. Right. Anything further from this witness? Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Shall you may call your next witness. Oh, Chris, <clears throat> Sergeant Lashley, if you'll come forward. Your Honor, I apologize for everything. You don't need to apologize. We have this problem routinely with people who are trying to zoom in with us on the phone. Officer, we say your name for the court. Yes, Chris Lashley. And you work for the Dixie County Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. And what rank do you hold? Sergeant. How long have you worked into law enforcement? 14 years. And in your 14 years of experience in law enforcement, have you had the opportunity to make calls out in the public for domestic related issues yes sir um and you had attempted on or you did on the second day of february have the opportunity to serve robert garvin is that correct yes sir and uh sergeant lashley from start to finish i'll give you the floor can you can you describe to the court what you witnessed and what you observed from the time that you went up to the apartment to the time that you left serving mr robert garvin uh, when I first got there, the door was cracked. I tried several attempts that day, and it was in the evening dark. 
Uh, the door was cracked open, knocked on the door, knocked on the door. Finally, uh, somebody answered the door. Uh, Mr. Gervin was on the back deck of the apartment. And we have two Mr. Gervins here that we're going back and forth between he and his brother. So would you be referring to Mr. Robert Gervin over here? Yes, sir. The gentleman in the red shirt was on the back porch. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, so when I got there, you know, finally, I guess it was his brother, answered the door, let me in. Uh, the house or the apartment was a wreck. It was a mess. I had seen the pictures that uh, Officer Moss had taken, and to me, it looked worse. Uh, the smell was, it was hard in there. Um, well, I made contact with him. Uh, he come in. I asked him, you know, I was like, you, know, you got a spot to where we can set the paperwork down, sign it. Yeah, and he kind of raked everything off the counter. said, here we go right here. I said, all right. Or can you explain it? Raked everything. Can you explain it a little bit? What what happened? You raked everything right. off the counter. The, the counters were covered with dirty dishes. Uh, it, it was it was a mess. And uh, just literally, if it hit the floor, it hit the floor. If it moved to the back of the counter, it moved to the back of the counter. Okay. But uh, he cleared the spot. We we signed the papers and walking out. You know, it was, was kind of aggravated. There was, I guess, you, I don't know if the gentleman's got a cat. There was a cat on the porch. Walking out of there, ended up with uh, cat feces all over the bottom of my boots. So it's yeah, it was. An experience. And did you pick that up at, at his apartment on the floor? Yes, sir. Just from walking through? Yes. The smell, can you, and not to not to belabor it, but the smell, can you describe what you were smelling when you walked in? It smelled like old trash, like trash bags that hadn't been taken out. That's it's dirty. Dirty, that's the best way I could describe it. So in your experience in law enforcement and, and dealing in domestic issues, uh, would you have found on February 2nd, 2024, his apartment to be suitable for a child to live in? No, sir. If, if you had gotten a call on February 2nd, there was a child there, what would have been your response to that? I would have got DCS involved in probably an emergency removal. That's all I had. Thank Thanks you. Sergeant Ashley. Did you ask either of the Mr. Gervins about the cat? I did not. Okay. So you don't know if it was a pet or stray or anything like that because you didn't have a conversation about it, right? I did not. Okay. Um, I asked the first officer that testified the same question, this question I'm going to ask you. Um, if on February 2nd, when you served Mr. Gervin, Gervin, if there wasn't trash on the floors or trash on the counters or dirty dishes everywhere, <clears throat> if the apartment was clean, would you have had the same concerns? Judge, again, I would object with the same objection I had last night. You know, there's, there's something speak for itself, but I'm going to overrule it and let him answer the question. That would be hard to answer because I don't know the gentleman. I was there to have him <clears throat> sign the papers. What I observed at the moment was unfit for a child. Okay. But had you not observed that, you observed the spotless apartment, clean counters, clean floors. Not you knowing any true. situation going on, no. You wouldn't have had the same concerns? Uh, okay. I'll, no. That's all I've got, Judge. No further. Sergeant Lashley, you may return to your duties. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. Holly, you may call your next witness. That's our proof, Judge. All right. The movement has rested their proof. You wish to offer any proof and rebuttal? Yes, sir. I'm going to call Mr. Gervin. Gervin, if you'll come forward, please. How old is she? Eight. Okay. And can you tell the court what kind of parenting plan, what kind of parenting time you get with your daughter prior to this restraining order? I get uh, two days during the week and then every other weekend. I get, well, um, from three o'clock to seven o'clock on the two days during the week. And then I usually pick her up, um, on, well, lately it's been on Fridays from three and then I drop her off usually around six on Sunday. I'm supposed to have her till seven, but I always get there about an hour, around an hour early. Okay. What sorts of things do you do with your daughter on your parenting time? So I have short term memory loss, so it's hard for me to remember what I do. Um, basically, we hang out at the house lately because I've been having trouble making money. Um, and so that's all we've been doing. But usually we go fishing. We we go to um, some wild uh, some wild refugees. Um, 
I, I think that's what it was called, like camping sites kind of. But we don't go camping, we just go there. And then we come home. Forgive me for asking. This may just be because I'm filling in for Mr. Barnhill, but you said you have short-term memory issues. Is that because of the cancer tumor and cancers? Yeah, they cut out the short-term in my in my brain, so I do have short-term memory loss. Long-term, I can remember things from like five years ago, like as if it happened yesterday. But short-term, my memory goes. Is that something that can that get better? Is that treated with medication or anything like that? I take medication, but the medication I take every day is for seizures. It prevents seizures. Okay. Um, are you taking those medications as prescribed? Every day. Up to date, current. Mm -hmm. Haven't had any issues with seizures lately? No. Um, you testified that, that here lately you've been having trouble earning money or, or trouble working so you guys would hang out at the house. Um, are you currently employed as it stands today? Yes. Okay. Tell the court a little bit about that. I uh, got hired a week ago. Uh, last Thursday, I got hired by a place called Midas. It's in Dixon, uh, Tennessee. Um, I had got my first paycheck today. Uh, um, okay. how, much are you, how much are you making at Midas? $15 an hour. And you just started, you said a week ago? Yes. What's your schedule like over there? Right now, I'm working every day, usually about 10, 11, sometimes even 12 hours. Okay. Um, on average, about 40 hours a week, you would suspect or more? Right now, it's looking at 50 to 60 hours a week. Okay. And do you get time and a half when you work overtime? Yes. If I go past 40, yes. Now, you've seen the, the pictures that have been shared with the court and entered into evidence. You've heard the testimony. Um, Your troubles working and earning money, is that the reason why you were having trouble cleaning with groceries? Yeah, same with groceries. Um, originally, I had gotten fired from Walmart for uh, absences when I was dealing, trying to deal with my brother. Um, so I ended up getting fired from Walmart, and then I figured I'll go to APSU, start school um, with my VA bill, and they would pay me. Problem is, is it was taking too long to get payment from the VA. So I had to quit school and then came back. So I started doing Instacart anyway to make money, you know? And uh, the, the day that the cops got called to my house was a, a day when I didn't have any money. But before, before all this, these past few months, I was making child support payments on time. My rent was being paid, my electric, my, all the bills were paid and I still had a little bit left over. But right now, I, I went downhill. I don't have much right now. And I'm trying to work to get that back. I'm trying to work to pay everything off. And it's starting to go. But uh, it'll take me a little bit more time to get fully up to where I can and then hopefully go past that and start to reach my maximum capability. So your testimony is that, that these issues were basically the product of a temporary hardship. Exactly. Okay. At any point when Elena was in your care, did you ever let her go hungry? No. If she was hungry, I found a way. Did you, you know, let it, her go thirsty? No. No. If she was thirsty, I would I would scrape every I would get quarters out of my box to buy her what she wanted. The things that she had was the things that she wanted. Not not just leftover stuff. If it had ever gotten to a point where you couldn't scrape together and make it happen, would you have reached out to the mom for help? I usually did, but they have problems too. My whole family has problems right now. It's very hard to get help. Would you have ever reached out to Ms. Tressler for help? Not with the way that she's been behaving. I mean, I'm bringing up, uh, I'm afraid to ask for help from, from the mother. Because I'm afraid I'm going to be stuck in situations like I am today. Anything I ask for, I'm afraid it's going to be turned back around on me. Let me ask you, if your child needed it, your child depended on it. If there was no other option, There's I no would. no other option, would you put that aside and ask Ms. Tressler for help? I would. Did you ever have to ask Ms. Tressler for help? No, it always comes at the last minute. I finally get some help. Um, you heard... Officer Moss testify earlier um, that he gave you some advice on how to get your, I think as he put it, get your act together. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, what steps have you taken to resolve some of these issues since that time? Oh, well, I called. He gave me a number. It was a uh, nine three three. Don't ask me how I remember it. It's just in my head. But um, he gave me that number, and I called him, and I was put on hold for a while. So I ended the call. You know, I, I uh, I'm running out of time, so I can't spend you know an hour on hold waiting to talk to somebody. I need help, and I can't get help from anybody. There's nobody that is willing to do anything to help me get out of this situation so that way I can go further. It's actually, it's sad to me. I, I've, I've applied to food stamps, I've applied to housing. Housing told me I'm a veteran, I gotta go on the veterans list. But food stamps, they, they don't wanna give me anything. I don't know why. I can't get anything from food stamps, I can't get anything from the veterans program. I can't get help anywhere. And I, I, I am trying my hardest, my hardest to do everything I possibly can. And it, 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 it's exhausting. It is flat out exhausting. I have, I have my brother. I got to take care of him every now and again because sometimes he, he forgets his meds. And when he does, his brain goes wild. But he has never been a single harm to any child. We had medical reports on that. He is not a harm to a child. And when he thinks he's going to harm himself, he checks himself into a hospital. Um, let's, let's, I don't want to talk about your brother. I, I still wanted to focus on you. Um, is it your testimony that you still need the help you were searching for now that you're working at Midas or now that, or now that you're working at Midas, can you afford food? I can, it, it'll take a, a week, but I'll have money to buy food. I'll, I'll fill my kitchen up in a week. Okay. Did you go grocery shopping this morning? No, my brother did. Is it your, you got paid today, right? I got paid today. Okay. You're going to go grocery shopping today? Yes. After I get out of here, I have to go grocery shopping. Um, you saw the pictures of the condition of your apartment. Yes. And I, I felt disgusted by it. Okay. You cleaned it? Yes. Okay. Um, Officer Moss testified that he directed you to take pictures to show the court. Did you do so? Yes. Okay. Would you recognize some of those pictures if I show them to you right now? Yes. A messy apartment. This first photo, is this the photo you were given in the papers you served with? Yes. What's the second photo there, Michelle? After I had cleaned. What does it show specifically? Just a coffee mug and um, just part of the stove top, but nothing else. A clean countertop and a clean stove? A clean countertop. Recognize that picture? Yes. Is that the exact same picture as before? Yes. Picture that is where we had a bunch of cardboard boxes piled up, and then I got rid of them all and I threw them away. What do you recognize this to be? That's the countertop. The, there's a center countertop in my kitchen. I clean that off. The floor, I didn't get a chance to mop. That's why you see black swaths on the floor. Is this like a kitchen island? Yeah, like an island. Okay. Um, is that the same kitchen island, but with trash and groceries on it? That is. Okay. That's now been cleaned. That's been cleaned. And that's an empty cupboard. Um, I need to fill that cupboard. Is the cupboard you might fill when you were shopping this afternoon? Yes. The paycheck you got today. Yes. And lastly, what is that picture show? Some, well, a cleaner stove top. There are still uh, those panels. I still need to scrub those panels. Um, I was actually able to pull it all off and I scrubbed underneath there. Uh, those, those panels are hard to clean. Well, for me, they were. Judge, at this time, uh, because I'm just a filling attorney, I don't have paper copies of these. I'd like to enter these into evidence as late file exhibits. Um, we'll let them be marked as a late file exhibit. Just collective one. Judge. Yes. Robert, what other steps have you taken to provide a a cleaner environment for your daughter. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, there's photos of trash in bedrooms. Or it, like, uh, as Ms. Tressler testified to, there were clothes on the floor and the bed's not made. I mean, the, those rooms have been cleaned up a little bit, but I have been limited on my time working uh, 10 to 12 hours a day. So I, I can only get 
like an hour to clean and some of them were, were horrible and they needed more time to be cleaned. Is it your plan to keep mm -hmm. your efforts going to clean the apartment for your daughter? Yes. Okay. Now you were here earlier when the judge was asking Ms. Tressler some questions about the photos. I think the judge held the photos up and you could see them on the screen. Um, the judge was talking about where some of the child's clothes are. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, when your daughter's at your house, where are her clothes normally? They're folded in her dresser. Do they ever go into the closet? No. Okay. All of her clothes. I, I don't have a lot of clothes for her, but the clothes that she does have at my house, they're usually folded up and put it into it. Or they're in a laundry hamper usually. Okay. But I don't, I don't have every day with her, so she doesn't have a lot of clothes. And the clothes that she does wear go back to her mom's. So is it your testimony that the, the pictures the judge was referencing earlier, your child's clothes would have been neatly folded and, and placed in the dresser, and that's why they're not there? Yes. Okay. She's a good girl. I don't, I, don't have to, uh, I don't have to yell at her. I don't have to punish her. Nothing like that. She's a great kid. If I ask her to do something, she does it. She doesn't question. Oh, well, even if she does questions, I can respond uh, to her. I, can, I just talk to her. And she pretty much will do what I ask her to do. I'm not, I'm not manipulating her, nothing like that. She's a good kid, and she's an intelligent, very intelligent, smarter than I am. I never made straight A's, but she has straight A's right now. I usually, when, when she comes home, I read to her. Or I was before. Well, she, she almost outread me. It's kind of weird. You heard some testimony from Ms. Tressler earlier, um, an argument from her lawyer about maybe you being a messy person and that this isn't the first time your apartment would have looked like this. Now, usually my apartment is pretty clean. I do sometimes fall off track and it gets messy and then I fix it. I go clean for a while, then I fall off track, it gets messy, it goes back and forth. You know, but for the most part, I try to do the best I can. And that's normal, would you say? It's normal. I think that happens with a lot of people. You know, sometimes you forget to throw your, your plate away, or sometimes you forget to wash the dishes because you've been working all day. You had something else going on that made you exhausted. You heard Ms. Tressler testify earlier um, that she doesn't want to keep your child away from you, that you can see your child as often as you like. She just wants visual proof of some things. Remember that? Yeah, I, I, I don't, what, I don't what, quite understand it. What do you, how do you feel about Ms. Tressler's request that she'd be able to walk around your apartment to give approval on whether or not? Oh, that would be fine with, sufficient. that would be fine with me if I can walk around her house. If we, because if we're going to have an even split, then if she's going to walk through my house, I believe I have the right to walk through hers. Do you have any concerns as to her house? No, not necessarily, not right now, but I'm not walking through her house. I, I go in every now and again, but even even if the house is dirty, I'm not, I'm not really one to report it. I, I, what I think to myself is maybe she needs help. Maybe she needs a, a I got to hurry up and get the child support so I wish she could have help. So in some way I can relieve her of it, not, not punish her, not take the kid away. My kid loves her just as much as she loves me. I don't want to take that from her. I can have all the hateful feelings I want against her. But it doesn't matter because it's about what my child wants. That's what I'm concerned with. Let me ask you, do you believe that's in your daughter's best interest that she not be allowed to see her dad on a regular basis? No, I think she needs us both. Her mom, her mom can be the, the emotional love support that every kid needs. But when she gets older and has to face the real world, she'll need somebody that can push her to accomplish what she needs to accomplish to be able to face anything. That comes from the father. The mother can support it a little bit, but at the end of it, it's the father who can get a child to do what they need to do. What are you asking this court to do at the end of the day? Well, for this hearing, drop the child order. It was a mistake. It won't happen again. I, I can say that I can, I can get my brother away, but he also can support me too. We kind of need each other. 
But if, if the court says he can't be around my brother, then it's done. He, he, I'll send him somewhere else. He'll move somewhere else. I'll have to deal with it all by myself. But for this, I, I, I wish this would go away. And I want to get a trial date. So I want to settle this, but every every order I get, it's it's always somewhere off. There's always some something that's that's off. Robert, I don't want to talk about your brother, and I don't want to talk about the the no contact with your brother. I don't want to talk about the contempt actions, specifically as it pertains to this restraining order. Are you telling the court that this was a a one off situation? This isn't the normal. This yeah, the, this part looks like this is a one off. Okay. And you're asking the court to dissolve the restraining order and let you exercise period of time with your child. I would greatly appreciate that. Judge, I, I think that's all I've got for Mr. Well, Mr. Holly, you might cross examine. You, you've seen the photographs that we put into evidence that, that Officer Moss took, correct? Yes. And with those photographs, you don't deny that was the look of your apartment at that time? At that period of time, that was how my apartment looked. You were living in it. You were living in there. Yes. You you know that's what it what it was like. Yes. You've heard uh, Officer Lashley, Sergeant Lashley, testify that uh, it's basically the same way. And that you know to clean off a spot, you just basically had to sweep everything into the floor just to find a spot to sign some papers. Yes. That's accurate. That's the way it was. Yes. Um, where does the feces come in that was all over the floor that he was stepping into? Do you have a cat or a dog? That wasn't feces. I don't have crap on my floor. He got if he if there was crap from his boot, it probably came from a stray cat that likes to spend his time outside. I don't have a cat. I don't have any animals. So you can't explain. I mean, you heard Officer Lashley's testimony. Yes. You can't explain that, or you won't explain it here today. No, because it's not relevant. That, I don't have any animal in my house, so if he's talking about um, feces on the ground, that's not in my house. So you think all the trash and all the things that were going on were appropriate for Elena to be over there? No. What are we talking about as far as the, you heard uh, Officer Moss testify that uh, there, was, there was beer cans and cigarettes throughout the apartment and that somebody was drinking, uh, John had said he was drinking beer in the morning. He did not drink a beer that whole day. Every time my daughter's around, we don't drink. So Officer Moss isn't telling the truth or John Garvin isn't telling the truth? I can't tell who's telling the truth between Officer Moss or them. It's, it's, I wasn't there. So uh, John has, you heard uh, Ms. Tressler testify that he has a diagnosis of like paranoid schizophrenia and there's mental diagnosis with John. Is that accurate? Are we here to talk about my brother or are we here to talk about me? We're talking about Elena. Elena. If you want me to answer the question, I very rarely ever do that. You but you understand ask, we're here to... Mr. Garvin, you don't get to ask questions. <coughs> Cross-examination, as unpleasant as it may be, you just listen to his question and then you answer it. If uh, you need to make another point, your lawyer can stand back up and ask you the appropriate question, but you don't get to question the lawyer. Yes, Your Honor. So, and you understand we're here to talk about Elena, correct? Yes. You understand the court doesn't care about you, doesn't care about Mrs. Tressler, doesn't care about anybody else in the whole room other than Elena. You understand that? Yes. And that's what we're here to talk about. So, with his diagnosis, it's paranoid schizophrenic, correct? Uh, schizoaffective is what Judge, I was I'm going to object to relevance. I'm not sure what psychiatric condition of the brother is relevant. Uh, and Judge, with that said... What we're talking about is the court order. There was a court order. I mean, I wrote down that he said if the, judge, if the court orders that he can't be, if she can't be around my brother, then he'll make sure she won't be around her brother. It's already been ordered. It has. And it was by an agreed order. His lawyer signed off on it. So it's already a court order. So I don't care what the reasons were so much as as the fact that there was a court order down, he either obeyed that or he didn't. And the proof is pretty overwhelming that he didn't. So I, I have to sustain the objection. It's not relevant as to the reasons why, uh, although there is a motion down to relieve that obligation or to relieve that restriction that has not yet been heard. So right okay. now we're operating under an order that specifically says that the child can't be around the brother and that proof has been that he was. Oh, my address, my address court. 
The, the only reason for the question was so that you'll have some history as to why that came about because that's not in the order. I don't so. need any history. Okay. I've got a court order that's valid on its face, and all I need is to know whether or not it was or was not complied with. All right. Yeah, so the reason agree. why it wasn't complied with might be relevant, but <clears throat> right now that's the only issue. So. Judge, may I briefly address the court as well, it not related to the objection? I have got some concerns. Um, on whether or not the court needs to hold a moment's hearing at this point. It's my understanding that there is an, an, a motion for contempt. I have not physically seen, but Mr. Barnhill has indicated that the, the motion is titled uh, motion for civil contempt, but in the body of the motion, there is a request for criminal contempt uh, remedies with a notice of rights. If there is a motion for criminal contempt, judge pending that then the witness has rights, and I'm very concerned that we're floating a line here between it's writing itself incrimination and and not the civil contempt is what's being sought but nonetheless well, we're at the noon hour we'll take our lunch recess now and then we'll come back and over the lunch hour you can confer with your client and let him know what his rights are and then we'll come back and get started about yes sir thank you judge 115. all right all right, Mr. Garvin, you understand this restraining order we're asking for is, is really based on not just the cleanliness of your house, but there are other things. We talked about being around your brother, no food in the home, those types of things. You understand that as well? Yes. So is it common for you to not have any food in your home like that when Elena comes over? No. You know, you heard the officer say that there was discussion that all she had was a old crusty piece of pizza and a Dr. Pepper. Uh, is that common or uncommon? Uncommon. Why was it common on this day when you happened to have the police call on you? <clears throat> At that time, I didn't have the money I needed. You said you were fired from Walmart. When were you fired from Walmart? In the December. In December, you got fired from Walmart? Yes. Why did you get fired from Walmart? Absences. Why were you so absent? Objection, Judge, relevance. <clears throat> well, if Judge, I'm trying to establish, you know, why he didn't have any food in the home. If the court wants me to delve into that, I, I will. If you don't, I'll move on. But I don't know why. That's up to him. If he wants to explain why there's no food in the house, that'll be, you can either answer the question or I'll draw my own conclusions. So as far as being, you know, let go from Walmart, <laughs> And you said it was absences. Why were you so absent? Do you understand the question? I do, in a, in a way. Well, you got fired for absences from Walmart in December. Why were you absent so many times that it, you know, in their rush traffic where they're looking for people left and right, why is it that, that you got fired from there from not showing up for work? Why were you that absent? What were the reasonings that you weren't there? They, they work off a point system. But I understand, but you didn't show up for days on end at work, apparently, and that's why you got fired. Why were you not at work? Can you answer that question? Not that, not I, can that I can remember. You said there were bugs. The officer testified bugs were coming out of glasses, and there were, you know, insects running around in your apartment. Are you familiar with that? That's due to the apartment itself. There's bugs in everybody's apartment. They've been sending uh, pest control people out. Why were there men's clothes in, Al in Elena's room? Because uh, Elena, she usually likes to sleep on the couch. So she's, uh, I usually sleep in that room and my brother sleeps in the other room. Your brother's living with you, correct? I plead the fifth. And, and just to stay on this line of questioning, your, uh, your brother was there with Elena on that day, correct? I plead the fifth. You testified you had short-term memory loss. Yes. Do you remember testifying to that? Have you have you had any sort of disability diagnosis because of this? And if so, what was it? The only disability I was able to receive was from uh, the doctor's office when I was just got out of cancer and I was still going back and forth to California to get my head scan. You have any disabilities today that would prevent you from testifying accurately and honestly? I don't think so. Well, that's not a very comforting 
answer as far as me having to ask questions and the and the judge letting me ask questions. You, you don't think so, or you you know so. I can answer some questions. It just it, it depends on if I can remember. Again, to to your knowledge, do you have any disability that pre that would prevent you from testifying truthfully and accurately today? No. And I know the order was done some time back, but just just to be clear, at the at that time, this time, I mean, you understand that John Gervin was to have no contact with your daughter. I played the fifth. You're working at, at Midas. You said you work every day. You talk about like every day of the week you're working? They're closed on Sunday, so six days. Six days, 10, 12 hours a day. Is that what you're testifying to? Yes, when uh, the order came down, if that order changes, my boss would let me go to pick up my daughter and anything I have to do with my daughter, he'd let me off. He's a very, very nice guy. Your brother still live with you? I played the fifth. You said that you were trying to get help. You know, you testified to the court that Officer Moss had given you some numbers and things and uh, through the Veterans Administration and other places you were trying to get help. And you testified that you tried to call, but you hung up because you were on hold for a while. Yes. You remember that? Yes. I remember the tone it played. When, when was that? The, I think maybe two days after he had told me about it. All right. At that time, you, you weren't working, correct? No, I didn't have a job yet. Okay. What did you have to do that was so important you could not wait to get help? <clears throat> I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What did you do? What, what did you have to do that was so important that you couldn't wait on the phone line to try to get some help for, for yourself as well as not to have this situation that we're in with your daughter? I had to go work, do an Instacart and DoorDash. You're going through the photographs, I think, with your with your lawyer here. You testified there were still like black spots in your floor that you hadn't mopped your floor yet. You remember that? Yes. When was the last time you mopped your floor? Yesterday. Were those black spots? And before yesterday, when's the last time you mopped your floor? Let me ask that. Uh, before yesterday? Well, yeah, you said you mopped it yesterday. And then before that, when was the last time you mopped your floor? Yesterday. Okay. I can't remember the time before. Those black spots in the floor, was that the fecal matter? Could that have been the no. fecal matter that everybody's talking about? It's not feces. I mean, you testified as well that this was the cleanliness of the home and those photographs and the things that we're looking at today, that it was kind of a back and forth thing that for, for a period of time, you know, your house looked that way, then you would clean it up and it would go back to that way, then you would clean it up. Is that... What I'm hearing from you that you testified to? Usually it's very clean. Well, my question is, and I'm going by what you said, you, your terminology you used was back and forth. Do you remember that? Yes. When you say back and forth, are you talking about it goes from what we saw in the photographs to being clean, back to what we saw in the photographs to being clean? Is that what you mean by back and forth? Yes. So there are several times a year, depending on what time it is, that you're you're saying your apartment is is clean, right? Yes. And there are times throughout the year, equal amounts of time, that your apartment is not clean and looks like those pictures. Correct. Not it. Not exactly. As dirty as those pictures were, that was the worst it had ever gotten. Usually, there might be uh, two cups out or something like that but I try to keep my apartment as clean as I can. But like I, I said before, uh, these couple of months have been really difficult. You talked about um, not wanting to report Mrs. Tressler like for a dirty home if she was to have one that um, you didn't want to, you know, get anybody in trouble, that you didn't want these hateful feelings is what I wrote down. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Do you blame Mrs. Tressler for, for having an issue with the way your house looked when the police called her to come over there and get Elena because of all this? Not necessarily. Can I have a moment, Judge? All right. 
Does your brother work? I plead the fifth. So when Elena was there in the condition that that photograph you know showed today, how did she operate in the apartment? What was she doing? She was playing on her her phone. She usually watches YouTube on her phone, or she'll get on Messenger and she'll be on there playing Roblox with her friends. She just walk around the piles of that stuff, and no, she usually she usually just sits on the couch. Doesn't really walk around. Nothing further. Redirect. Just briefly judging. <clears throat> Robert, you were just asked on cross examination about your earlier testimony. Um, you recall testifying when you first took the stand that your apartment, as it appeared in those pictures, was a one off. Do you remember? Yes. Is it your testimony that your apartment has never looked that bad? That was a one. No, it has never been that bad before. And when opposing counsel was questioning you on your testimony about going back and forth, uh, explain that. I mean, maybe your apartment would get a little messy. Some laundry needed to be done. Yeah. Some dishes needed to be done. Yeah. You'd clean it mm -hmm. a couple weeks later, maybe some more dishes, more laundry a couple weeks later, maybe some more. Yeah. But never that bad. No, it has never been that bad before. And as it exists today, your apartment does not look like that. No. Is that right? No, not nearly that. Okay. Judge, I have nothing further. Nothing further. You, uh, I know that you have some issues. Have you, are you receiving a disability payment? No, they, they stopped giving me disability about Where was your, a year and a half ago. They where was your disability from? It was out of California. Because it was a state? It was a state disability. <clears throat> okay, and you no longer live in, Al in California, so they stopped your disability. All right, <clears throat> but that's the only type of disability that you've had. Mm -hmm. And then you, you are working now on uh, six days a week, essentially, and uh, making $15 an hour, if I understood correctly. All right. Yes. Um, I want to explain to you so that, that I know your, your lawyers probably also <laughs> talked with you about it. Invoking the Fifth Amendment is your right, but the Fifth Amendment is, a, is an amendment to the Constitution of the United States that says you have the right to not have to incriminate yourself in criminal conduct. You are charged with civil contempt, which is basically what your uh, former, or what the mother of your child is saying, that you have violated a court order and that you should be punished civilly, which means I could put you in jail for six months until you bring yourself into compliance with the court's order. Criminal contempt is that for every time you violate a court order, I put you in jail for 10 days. And that's the reason. I've told opposing counsel, it's criminal contempt for the contact with his brother, civil contempt for the child support. There's two contempt. Well, I'm referring to your um, motion that you filed, motion for contempt and sanctions. <clears throat> and it says, you hereby move the court for an order holding the petitioner, Robert Allen Gervin, in civil contempt. And we show the following. That's filed January the 31st of 2024. Yeah, that's a misprint. I need to amend that. Number eight on there says I'm asking for criminal contempt 10 days and all that. So I'll have to re revise that just to let the court know. I, I will be asking for criminal contempt on the contact part. I'm sorry, Judge. That's all right. <clears throat> I'm going by the plain language of the uh, introduction, and that's basically what it was. But so you understand, by, by taking the Fifth Amendment, you're simply saying my answers might incriminate me in some sort of criminal conduct. So you invoked your uh, Fifth Amendment, and I have to draw whatever I draw from that from that right that you've exercised. But I understand you want to see your daughter, but do you understand my only concern is your safety and well-being of your daughter. If I can ensure that she's that she's receiving proper care, then I want you to have that visitation. But if I cannot be assured of that, or if you're not in compliance with the court order, if you're not going to comply with the court order, then that's going to have other sanctions. What I want you to understand is that <clears throat> the court order is not something you can simply say, well, I'm not going to abide by it this time. If the mother of your child, if Ms. Tressler simply said, you know, I don't like the, act, the fact that he's got court order visitation this weekend, so I'm just not going to let her go, you wouldn't like that very much, would you? And you would expect the court to enforce that order, wouldn't you? And that would be by a finding of contempt. So what I want you to understand is, is that my job is to ensure the safety and well-being of your daughter. 
And your job is to follow the court orders and put your child's interest, your child's best interest first above your brother. I understand you want to try to help your brother, but you got to put your daughter above your brother. I've got brothers, but I don't put them ahead of my, my children. My children come first. So you have that relationship and I know you feel put upon that you're having to help your brother, but it's the most important thing in your life ought to be the safety and well-being of your daughter. And when I see those pictures that I've seen, you can understand you said it's a one-off, which I understand that's a lawyer. That's a term your lawyer has come up with for you to say that was a one-time only thing. <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree with that because of the simple fact that um, Sergeant Lashley came in and testified that uh, it was the same situation when he came to serve you with this restraining order. So you can understand I can only judge it by what I hear and what I see. All right, step down. Do you have any other witnesses? No, Judge, that would be false. Any rebuttal proof? No, sir. <clears throat> Argue the case, I'll hear you in argument. Real brief, Judge. I... <clears throat> it's brief by your terms or brief by my standards? Would they be different? I don't know. That would be a question. Subjective. Subjective. It is subjective. Subjective. Mm -hmm. Judge, um, this this apartment was neglectful. It, it just gives rise to that that conduct. That is correct by opposing counsel when he brought that up. Uh, Ms. Tressler's really struggling with this for one reason. You heard her testify. Um, Landa loves her dad. Landa wants to spend time with her dad. One of the reasons we've struggled in this case so much. Uh, but this is an ongoing thing she testified to. It's back and forth as he agreed with. And we're trying to figure out and, and hit a spot here where, where Elaine is protected, yet dad gets to see gets to see her, she gets to see her father. Um, it's one of these things where what we would ask for is, is for the restraining order to continue, but uh, work something out where maybe it's at the mother's discretion. Uh, there's been no question at all about her discretion at this hearing, and it wouldn't be if we had the final hearing. I, I can tell you she could work this out where they could- What if you set the uh, other motion for contempt? Because of the TRO being set the way that it was, I didn't have under the rules of civil procedure time to hear it <coughs> on today's date, and it's set on the 26th. Of this month? Yes, sir. So it's set on the 26th, and I'll amend that. Uh, that's, that first paragraph definitely says civil contempt, uh, but I, I would be asking for criminal on that. Um, there's There's gotta be a, a, a happy middle ground here, possibly where Ms. Tressler could be in charge of this thing and let her show you some good faith and move on through the 26th in the final hearing. and. Uh, if we come in on 2026, 20, I know this isn't his regular lawyer, so maybe we can set it for a final hearing, get this thing moved along a little bit, but let her have a chance to show you some good faith to say, hey, yeah, you can go see your dad. Let her have the ability to, to walk into the, thre and like I said, not go through the through the drawers of everybody, but walk through the threshold of the door, maybe look, okay, fine. You know, have a great visit. John Gervin can't be around whatsoever, and he split the fifth now to a lot of these questions regarding the safety of her being around him. And it's very concerning that the apartment looks this way with him living there and that apparently he's drinking beer in the early morning hours, according to what the officer testified to, uh, because he was thirsty. And with his situation, that does not need to happen whatsoever. Um, what we do with that, I don't know. Um, I, Ms. Tressler can use her own discretion as to whether he's there, I guess, or, or whatnot, but they could do public park for a little while or you know go to school or do some things like that. Um, but there would be a, a significant problem with, with the brother. We need to find some reiteration that he's not going to be there. I don't think there's any question that he violated the order. He testified to it before we started pleading the fifth that, you know, the brother was there and around the land on that day. And what they testified to with the officer, I think, really sums that up. And it goes a little further with the trust issue, of course, with uh, Mr. Garvin. You can't be trusted. There is an order down that says you cannot have contact with your brother. He knew that. And as the court pointed out, it was an agreed order. He agreed that his brother was in a position where he shouldn't be around, you know, Elena at that time. And now here we are. And we all thought it was different. But when the police got called and they went in on a welfare check, you know, we have learned otherwise. I'm asking for, you know, this restraining order to continue. Let let the visitation be at Ms. Tressler's uh, basically discretion. And I can tell you, if you'll do that and get to the 26 and get to the final hearing, allow her to use good faith in, in letting them see each other. Because as she testified so the to, the twenty-six is just your motion for contempt. It's not the final hearing, correct? It was not. No, sir. We have not set the final hearing. It's just the contempt on the contact and the contempt for the child support. He's a little behind on the child support. I understand he's got some checks today, and uh, he's going to give those up, and we'll take a look at those. But um, I think if you leave this up, basically the the end argument to Miss Tressler and the good faith of her being able to work out some visitation, I think you'll see that that'll work out. Maybe we we'll get to the final hearing and be able to do some other things. Thank you for your time today.
Judge, I think it goes without saying, <coughs> the least amount of drama we can interject into this case, the better off the child will be, the better off the parties will be. Um, in my experience in these domestic cases, Judge, whenever one party has what I'll call all the power or has the authority to walk through someone's house and says, no, there's a dirty coffee cup right there on the counter or in the sink. You need to wash that dish. That's not sufficient for me. So you don't get to exercise your parenting time. Having that authority invested in one party is wrought for abuse and oftentimes is abused in these types of situations. Uh, the father would oppose uh, vehemently uh, the mom having that authority. Now, that's a different story if the court wants to order the father to provide her pictures of a clean house uh, or a clean sink or a clean bedroom floor or whatever. I think that's sufficient. But having a party with the authority that can walk through someone's home and use her own subjective opinions to prohibit the father from exercising time with the kids, as both parties have testified, is in the best interest of the child anyways. The child being able to see mom, the child being able to see dad on a regular and consistent basis. Now, the pictures that you've seen, Judge, yeah, they speak for themselves. And the father has testified today that it's, it's a one-off. His house has never looked that bad. But if you look at the written motion, Judge, the motion asks for the court to continue the restraining order until two conditions have been met. The motion specifically says that the, the restraining order they're requesting be continued until two, two things happen. One, the father is gainfully employed. Two, when the conditions of his apartment have been alleviated. You've seen pictures today, Judge. You've heard the testimony of my client that the apartment no longer looks as the way it does in those pictures that have been attached to the motion itself and entered into it, uh, evidence as Exhibit 1 or Exhibit 2. That condition's been met. And you've also heard testimony from the father that the second condition's been met. He's now gainfully employed. He's employed here locally, making $15 an hour with Midas, working six days a week while he can't see his kid. Just got his first paycheck today. Got his first paycheck today and plans on grocery shopping when he leaves court today so that he can put food in the fridge and food in the pantry for the benefit of this kid. Judge, I, I don't believe that there exists any continuing harm to this child and letting this child go to her dad's apartment. The apartment is in much better shape. Dad testified to that. Dad provided pictures of the same. The conditions with which the, the mom has requested the restraining order be kept in place, those conditions have been met. There is no continuing harm that would justify keeping the restraining order in place and prohibiting the father from exercising his parenting time. At the end of the day, Judge, I think everybody understands that you have to do what's best for the child. And I would submit to the court, Your Honor, that's what, that what, that's what is best for this child is that she is allowed to see her father on a regular basis, as she has been the last several years. It's my understanding this case has been pending since 2020 or 2021 uh, and going down the road to a final hearing, but, but cutting off all contact with dad visitation with dad when there's really no true continuing harm here it doesn't serve the best interest of this child uh, your honor we would ask that the court dissolve the order of the not the order of protection but the restraining order that prohibits dad from doing so in such cases the court's obligation is to balance the rights of the parents with the uh, best interest of the minor child which as i've stated more than once the best interest of the minor child is always paramount in the whole story, as our appellate courts like to refer to it, of any custody case, of any custody decision. And certainly it is this court's primary concern is the best interest of the child. So what I'm faced with is <clears throat> a suspension of the previous order of visitation and rendering to Ms. Tressler the right to govern allowing the child to see the father or not see the, the father as she sees it might be appropriate. I don't really get <clears throat> that from her testimony that she's that insistent upon her being in control of it. I think she just wants her daughter to be safe. I think she, just, she wants her to see her father and I don't think she wants her to just be safe. And I've already made a statement and I'll make a finding that the conditions of the apartment as shown in these pictures and based on the testimony of not one but two officers on different days, the conditions of your apartment, Mr. Garvin, were unacceptable for a child of eight years of age. They're actually unacceptable for a grown man or two grown men to live in that condition. But that was your choice. Problem is your daughter doesn't have that choice. If she wants to see her father, she has to come into whatever conditions you have. And that means I have to protect her. <clears throat> so um, the other option I have is to suspend completely the visitation 
um, based on a violation of the court's order regarding your brother. Um, but it is this court's opinion that this hearing is limited today to the extension of the restraining order. I'm not going to extend the restraining order. Instead, I'm going to put a new order down regarding that will govern how <clears throat> Mr. Garvin sees his children, his child, his daughter. He has right now Wednesday and Thursday of each week after school for a couple of hours, correct? Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday and Friday? Yes, sir. And that's, is that on every week or every other week? I thought I read that it was. It's, it's every week for the Wednesday and Friday, but if it's his weekend, he just keeps her till Sunday. Well, we're going to leave the Wednesday to Friday, um, but I want you to be able to, are you, uh, you coach, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, are sir. You, are you, you don't have to stand up, you can sit down. <laughs> um, when you are coaching, what time do you get through at school? You're at um, Creekwood? Well, I coach at the elementary school, um, but I coach track and field at Creekwood. So I leave Charlotte Elementary and go over to Creekwood. My practices are from um, four to six. Okay. So, and that's five days a week? Um, we typ I typically try not to do Wednesdays, but I'm at the mercy of the weather. So sometimes I have to, you know, cancel a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday and pull up a Wednesday. All right. Well, look, we're going to allow Mr. Uh, Gervin to have the Wednesday afternoon and Friday afternoon okay. <clears throat> visitations. And second thing we're going to do is we're going to suspend the every other weekend visitation and instead replace it with every other Sunday okay. from the morning until, let's say, 9 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Um, Mr. Gervin, what I want is I want to give you the frequency similar to what you already have, but we're doing this to try to ensure that your daughter is particularly is, pro is properly cared for. This is conditioned on your brother having no contact with, I mean, she can, he can be gone. There's no overnight visitation. He can go anywhere in the world and be gone while she's there. If he still lives with you, can't be around her. That is a court order. And when we come back on the motion for contempt, you're liable. You're probably going to be found guilty of violating it. <clears throat> but what I want you to do is to have the opportunity to provide a good home for your daughter and not one that she's going to grow up remembering how trashy her dad lived and what kind of a conditions is. She loves you. She wants to be with you. And she's willing to step over piles of groceries, of, of trash, piles of clothes, and live in a house there with you with little or no food. And she's willing to overlook the bugs that are there, the ashtrays or the planter full of, of ashtrays and things. I will say this. Somebody in your house had enough money to smoke a whole lot of cigarettes and to drink some beer uh, because that's what I see in these photographs. And if you got the money to do that, but you don't have the money to provide a decent meal for your daughter, you are not much of a father. You understand that? You have looked after your own needs and your addictions more than you have provided a decent place for your daughter to see her father. And she wants to be with you. And that's the, really the only reason I think that, that, that I am inclined to continue the, the frequency of these visits is because I know she wants to be with you. But if I find out when we come back on the 26th that you have violated this court's order one time, and I don't mean, you know, I, I'm not going to listen to any excuses about Fifth Amendment in violation of Fifth Amendment rights and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to testify. If the proof is to me that you have violated this court's order again, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to enforce it. That means that you may go to jail. Civil contempt is I put you in jail for six months until you comply with the court's order. I can't do it but six months, but I can do it twice a year. You understand what that is? And I've put men in jail for not paying child support. You might want to think about that because somebody who comes before me that doesn't pay their child support is, again, a situation where it's a court order. And if you're not, if you're not in compliance with the court order, then I have no sympathy for you. I mean, I understand you've had a rough way to go and you've had some, some problems. I'm trying to help you. And if you need to get help from whatever source, uh, then you need to, to follow up on that. You can't just give up because you stayed on the phone for a long time. If that were the case, <laughs> there are a lot of things I would have given up on when I put on hold. I hate being put on hold, especially when they play that, that music that gets in your ear and you have to sit there and listen to it. I'm talking about a psychological tor torture. That's pretty much it. But the fact is, is that's the only way sometimes you can do it. You've got to persevere. So. What I'm telling you is this, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that this situation has been cleaned up at your house, but I want for the first time on Sunday, Ms. Tressler will deliver your daughter to your door. You will open the door for her. She will stand outside the door. She will look inside the, the apartment. And if it's clean and, and orderly, 
your daughter will go right in. She's not going to know what you're doing. Don't talk to your daughter about, hey, if it's not clean, you're not going into your dad. I got to take a look at it. Just say, I wanted to help you go see your dad, so I'm delivering you. Then you take a look at it. And if it's not in good, good shape, if it's stuff like this in these pictures, then you just get your daughter and go home. And then you tell your lawyer, and then we'll have Mr. Uh, Gervin uh, address with that. <clears throat> the point of that is not to allow her to control your life. It is for her to verify the concerns that both she and I have about the conditions in your home. Men aren't always good housekeepers. I'm not the best housekeeper in the world either, but I believe I can do a better job than that, no matter what the situation is, especially if you're not working. If you've got a brother that's trashing up your place, kick him out. Get him to, you know, get him to go find his own place. I'm letting you live there with your brother if that's what has to happen, but I'm not letting you have overnight visitation because I have no confidence that you'll kick your brother out overnight, but he can be gone during the day. And I want you to understand, if he's around this child, I don't care whether it was fair or unfair that that agreement was made. It is a court order, and that court order will be followed, or there will be sanctions that will be imposed. Do you understand that? And the 26th of this month is when I have to determine what, if any, sanctions are going to be applied to you. I don't like putting people in jail for these kinds of things, but I have done it more times than I can count, and I will do it to you if you violate this order again. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. <clears throat> then I will... Uh, Make that the order of the court. All the other issues are reserved for the 26th for the hearing on contempt. Uh, he will have the right to pick the child up from school as he's done in the past. If he's able to do so with your work. Part of the reason I'm doing this is so you can work those six days that you've been talking about. And Sunday you're off anyway. <clears throat> so you can try to use that to catch up some of these child support payments that you may have been missing. Come into court on the 26th and you're current. Guess what? It's not likely that you're going to go to jail. Come here on the 26th and you've been working $15 an hour for all of these hours and you haven't paid any child support, guess what? You're going to go to jail. So I just want you to understand the significance of what I've done today. Do you understand that, Mr. Gervin? I know you have a, a problem with a short-term short memory, but I, I'm concerned about the conditions in your house. And if, uh, if I need to send someone else over there to take a look at it, then I'll do that. All right. DCS has never responded to any of this allegation, correct? Understood. They may have talked to the young uh, Elena at school, but as far as Miss Tressler goes, they, she's not had any actual contact. Well, so I don't know what they're doing. And I say DCS is Child Protective Services now. I guess. Uh, Child Protective Services is, you know, supposed to be following up on this. And I imagine there may be somebody that will just show up at your door one day, see, and walk in your house whether you want them to or not, to see what the conditions are. But you better make sure you keep it clean and neat. It doesn't have to be spotless, but it better not be in the condition it's in this time. Anything before then, we adjourn. No, sir. Judge, I'll draft the order and send it around. He's got about $1,200 in checks here and money orders for child support. Well, if it's I'm not a collection order, agency. I, Mr. Holly can help you with that. So. I, judge, I just want to pass these over to us counsel for the presence right. of the court. So if there's any issues, come time for the, the civil contempt on child support issue with Mr. Barnhill. Everybody can be on the <clears> I don't know where you check to try to get yourself some help, but there are agencies out there that can help you. and. You know, if you need any, um, you know, you might want to, for example, the Help Center here in Dixon is one of the greatest institutions that, that we have in our county. <clears throat> I've gone there to buy stuff for myself, but you can go there and you can find what you need and you can get assistance from them at the Help Center. Um, and that would be something I would suggest to you if you start running short of groceries or things like that. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, churches that will do that. So just don't give up because you get frustrated. You gotta go after, go after there and try to do it. What I want more than anything is for the two of you, Ms. Tressler and Mr. Gervin, to put your child's best interest first and set aside any kind of animosity or anger you've had towards one another and start thinking about how this affects your daughter. How does it affect your daughter that the police had to come to your house and have her removed from your house because of the conditions that you said were not acceptable? You told me that today. Think about how she feels about that. That's a memory that she's now going to have for the rest of her life. And if you two can get along, then she can have a good life and she'll love both of her parents and have a good relationship with both. If you don't get along, if you get resentful towards her because she's trying to protect her daughter, or if Ms. Tressler gets uh, resentful and tries to control the situation and harm you with keep you from seeing your daughter, if y'all have a lot of anger and animosity, then your daughter's life is going to be ruined and every major event in her life will be a, a, a calamitous emotional trauma, uh, whether it's a graduation from school, uh, Christmas, any other kinds of holiday visitation, graduation from high school, graduation from college, marriage, 
you know, she, I assume you'd like to be at your daughter's wedding and have a, a peaceful and harmonious and joyful occasion for everybody. You can do it if you two will get along. You also have to think about, from my standpoint, grandchildren. At some point, you're still young, but eventually you might have grandchildren. And if you do, the best thing you can do is to get along well enough so that you can both be involved in your grandchildren's lives and they can have a good relationship with you. <clears throat> my daughter's about to give birth to a, my seventh grandchild here in a little bit, and hopefully it all goes well, but I plan to be there for that. If there's any way in heaven or earth that I can be there, and I want to make sure that you understand that that's the kind of thing you can look forward to if both of you get along, okay? All right, I think you're both good people. I think you've had a rough way to go, and I think Miss Tressler is a good mother who wants to protect her daughter. So let's try to make sure that this doesn't happen again, okay? All right, that's the judgment of the court. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Judge. Thank you.